Never seen snow, that's for sure, not there. We've been hunter-gatherers for more than 90% of human history. There's still a band of about a thousand click-speaking hunter-gatherers living in the Great Rift Valley of Tanzania called the Wahadze Bay. Their language is not related to any other click-speaking languages. Genetic evidence suggests that the Wahadze Bay have long been an isolated island of humanity. The Hadza, as they are commonly known, live in Tanzania, East Africa, as shown by this red circle. For tens, possibly hundreds of thousands of years, they've enjoyed living and hunting on the wildlife-rich lands between Ngorongoro Highlands and the lush grass of the Serengeti Plains. Their homeland, as you see by the red mark on this map, is adjacent to the Serengeti ecosystem, shown in green, and within 25 miles of Olduvai Gorge, where the Leakey family found many early hominid remains. They also live within 25 miles of Loitali, the site of the oldest upright walking hominid footprints ever found. It is theorized that the Hadza are our oldest living ancestors. We've given loads of attention to the Loitali footprints and the Olduvai Gorge discoveries, but very little has been done to help the living Hadza people who are facing diminishing numbers, land encroachment, and loss of their tribal traditions. Most of today's Hadza are still subsistence hunters, who make their own bows and arrows from local trees and shrubs. Feathers are attached with animal sinew. This arrowhead is being pounded from a nail that was found. The necklaces you see here are made of porcupine quills and seeds. These three hunters have several bush babies and two species of birds that they killed that morning. Small game like this is generally cooked and eaten on the spot as trail food. When hunting for large game, poison tipped arrows are used. And the poison is so lethal that once put on the tip, the tips are wrapped in hide. One nick could kill a person. Hunters always travel with fire making sticks and they can have a fire burning in less time than I have to finish this slide. These small bush babies were thrown on the fire, hair, guts and all, and then eaten. When large animals are killed, the entire band will move camp to the site of the kill and feast on the meat. Of course, nothing is wasted. When wildlife is scarce, the Bushman diet is composed mostly of fruit, honey, and tubers. This hunter is using smoke to sedate honeybees. Having watched this process many times, it seems to me the honey specialists have a certain power over the bees, as they are rarely stung, even when doing a direct assault on the hive. Women specialize in gathering tubers, berries, and greens. They go gathering in social groups and use digging sticks to hunt for tubers. These tubers are very sweet and full of moisture. I prefer them baked when they taste like sweet potatoes. The Hadza completely rely on the land to feed themselves, and through thousands of years of oral history, we know the Hadza have never experienced famine. Our kids climbed into the hole at the bottom of this baobab tree, up the inside and out on the top branch where you see them there. This hole in the tree is used as a safe birthing center for Hadza women. Our Hadza friend Julius Ndaya was born in this tree, as were his children. The Hadza don't normally scarify for beauty, so we knew that these scars told a story. This hunter fell from a tree, gathering honey, and broke his back. He lay in his small hut for over a year, attended by traditional healers, which left him with these scars. He is happily out hunting again, a real tribute to Hadza toughness and resilience. These are Maasai settlements on traditional Hadza land. Not only do they displace the Hadza, but they also displace important wildlife populations. In just a, the past few decades, these agricultural and pastoral tribes have almost completely gobbled up all the traditional Hadza hunting grounds. The Hadza homeland is adjacent to the Serengeti Plains, about four times the size of Yellowstone. It's home to one of the largest migrations on Earth, made up of nearly two million wildebeest. Although the research has been done on the wildlife populations and the genetic history of the Hadza, their language and their DNA, no one is addressing the current loss of land needed to support the Hadza lifestyle. We have made many Hadza friends over the years, so we decided to help organize an effort to inform the Hadza of their rights to land as Tanzanian citizens, so they can identify leaders and organize a campaign to preserve some of their traditional hunting grounds. We started the Hadza Preservation Trust in 2010. Last summer, we sent this team down to start community outreach and mapping. This is our son, Makari, who was the techno expert in charge of GPS and mapping. 
Uh, the small guy in the middle is Umdalali, a native click speaker and translator, and Fred Laurie on the right is a Maasai community development officer. These three could communicate in Kiswahili. One of our pickup trucks traveled around the various Hadza encampments, loaded up with as many Hadza and village officials that could squeeze in, usually 25 to 30 people, and traveled village boundaries, greeted friends, and mapped important sites and hunting grounds. All in all, it was a very social time. We ended up with a series of maps that looked like this, that aren't so fuzzy on a smaller piece of paper, and um, can be taken to the village land officers. In addition to the mapping, the team talked to the Hadza about their rights and began planning a grand assembly of tribal members where they can collectively identify their priorities and leaders and make a case for legal consentment of their traditional land. In addition to the mapping and community work, we've started an eco-tourism program with the Hadza to help them raise funds. We've identified campsites like the one in this picture. Our visitors pay camping fees to the Hadza, money that goes collectively to the tribe. The Hadza provides security by night and a fascinating insight into hunter-gatherer life by day. Visitors can go on hikes and search for game while the Hadza hunt, dig roots, and gather honey. They can share a traditional meal with the clan. We work with the visitors so they don't disrupt the Hadza lifestyle too much. A tricky balancing act is just going into the area with the outsiders is a huge impact on their culture. However, we are hopeful that by increasing awareness of the tourists, this ecotourism program may help the Hadza to survive in some small way into the future. These are our kids having made their own bows and arrows, now sighting in on their parents. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>